Hey, Two Cities Church, Pastor Kyle here, and we're back in the book of market. But today, we've got a special guest all the way from Halifax, Nova Scotia. We have Jeremy Dagger with us today. Now, Jeremy's been a friend for years. He was a pastor at Mercy Hill Church just down the street in Greensboro, North Carolina. But three months ago, he, his wife, their five kids, they said a gospel goodbye. They moved from Greensboro, North Carolina to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Why? To plant a new gospel-centered church there. And we're eager to partner with him. And part of partnering with him is I want you to get to know him. So I've invited him. He's going to be jumping into Mark chapter 9 and preaching God's word to us today. So would you put your hands together as he comes to the stage? All right. Two Cities Church. It is, uh, it is a joy to be here with you guys uh, this morning. Uh, yeah, I love your church. I love your pastors. I've been friends with Pastor Kyle for over a decade now. He has been such an encouragement to me in ministry, always willing to help out. And so it's just an encouragement for me to be here. Also because, you know, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, uh, my family and I moved our life from Raleigh, Durham. We were at the Summit Church there and we went and helped plant Mercy Hill Church. And so we've been right down the street and kind of had a front row seat to kind of watch what God has been doing here at Two Cities Church. And it is nothing short of incredible. I believe that you guys are kind of in that Ephesians 3.20 moment where Paul says that God is doing abundantly above all we could ask or imagine. I think that's kind of the moment that you guys are in. And here's the thing, being at Mercy Hill and kind of seeing God do some incredible things, one of the things I realized is like when you're in it, sometimes you can miss it. Like sometimes you don't get the full kind of brevity as to what God is doing. And so let me just kind of say from the outside uh, that what God is doing here is nothing short of amazing. The life change that you guys are seeing, the, the people that are coming from death to life, the, the, the sin struggles that are being overcome, all the things that you guys are seeing here at Two Cities Church is nothing short of amazing. There are people that will go their entire life and not see a fraction of what you are seeing God do here. And I tell you that not because I want you to feel guilty about that or ashamed of that. In fact, quite the opposite. I tell you that so that you can rejoice in it and give glory to God for it. One of the things that we said at Mercy Hill is that in light of what God has done, we wanna praise him for what he's done and we wanna pray for more. So that's my exhortation to you guys as a church. Would you praise God for what he is doing at this church and then would you get on your knees and beg God for more? Beg God to do more. All right, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Mark. We're gonna be in Mark chapter nine, moving along in the series that you guys are in. And as you guys are turning to the book of Mark, if you'll just maybe indulge me for a second and just let me tell you some of the things that God has been up to in the last four months since kind of our team has all kind of coalesced and come together in Halifax, Nova Scotia. You know, if you're like me, uh, you grew up in church. And uh, one of the things growing up in church that I always loved was when uh, a missionary would come from some crazy place uh, in the world and, and they would you know, kind of share what God was doing. And the missionaries would always have two things. They'd always have one of those kind of like old school carousel projectors, you know, they had a little two by two uh, kind of picture slide and you like stick it in and like, you know, just go around and look at all the grainy pictures of the, you know, whatever they were in the world. Uh, you know, so they always had those and they always had amazing stories of like what God uh, was doing all around the world. So I went on Amazon, I could not find a carousel projector. So like we don't have grainy pictures of Halifax for you. Uh, but I do have some really cool stories of what God has done in just the last four months, okay? So let me share. So uh, in the last four months, three of our team, okay? Three different people on our launch team have shared the gospel with someone in Halifax who has never heard the name of Jesus before. <laughs> like, not like they hadn't heard, like, of our church or whatever. Like, they've never heard the name of Jesus. One of our team members, Carol, she moved uh, from her and her husband, semi-retired, five grandkids, had a heart for Eastern Canada. I, I, you don't meet a whole lot of people that have traveled extensively to the Eastern part of Canada and who have a real heart and a desire to see more gospel-centered churches there. Uh, but the reality is they do. And I got to know them because uh, their daughter went to Mercy Hill Church and, and I got to do their wedding and their marriage counseling and all that kind of stuff. And so I got to know this family, found out that they had a desire, uh, they had a heart for Eastern Canada. We decided to plant a church there. They uproot their life in Kentucky and they move with us. And so Carol's over at our house last week for Thanksgiving. Yes, Canadians do Thanksgiving in October, right? So now I'm listening to Christmas music and I'm very confused. I'm like, <laughs> something about this doesn't seem right. Carol's over our house and she begins to unpack a story with us about her adventure to the superstore, the Atlantic superstore, the grocery store, uh, a week prior. She begins to tell us how she's in the grocery store and she meets a gentleman there. He's a refugee from Iran. He's working in the grocery store and she just starts sharing her story with him. And she starts telling him about how Jesus has changed her life and he stops her and he says, hold on, hold on one second. He says, you say, Jesus, I don't know 
Jesus, who's Jesus? And Carol gets to share with this guy for the very first time in his entire life who Jesus is and what he's done for her and what he could do for him. I'm in the gym several weeks ago and I meet a guy named Chris and I get a chance to talk to Chris. Of course, the question always comes up like, hey, why are you here? You know, and so I'm like, well, I'm a pastor. That's usually a conversation killer. Um, usually no one knows where to go with that. And uh, so I, I tell Chris, you know, I'm a pastor and we're part of helping a church get started here. And he, he looks at me kind of funny and I'm like, oh, here we go. And he said, you know, it's interesting. He said, I've never met a pastor in my life. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, you mean like a Baptist pastor? And he's like, no, 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 like I've never met a pastor, like ever. He's 35 years old. He's got two kids. He's a civil engineer. He grew up in Halifax. He's never met a pastor. And he says to me, he goes, he goes, man, you're not really the image of a pastor that I thought. And I was like, hey, I don't want you to elaborate. I don't want to know, good or bad, like just, let's just keep it there. And we begin to talk about religion and just what that means and how he's loved to study religion. And I share those stories with you guys because you're a church that takes very seriously partnering with other churches like ours to send, to support, and to shepherd. And I, what I wanna encourage you guys with is that as you do that, as you, as you dive into that partnership, you are a part of seeing the gospel go forth in powerful ways all around the world. Whether it's you know, right here in the United States and places like South Carolina with, with Jeremy, whether it's in Canada with us, whether it's in London with Thomas, you guys, what you're doing in your partnership, you're allowing those stories to just continue one after the other, after the other, after the other. And if you've ever given and you're kind of wondering, man, is my generosity here like at Two Cities Church, like is it, do, what is it doing? I want there to be zero doubt in your mind that when you sow into the ministry here at Two Cities Church, that it is fueling gospel growth in places that you probably never even heard about. <laughs> so I tell you that, I hope that's an encouragement to you. I just wanna say from the bottom of my heart, from our team in Halifax, Nova Scotia, thank you. We are so grateful for you guys in your partnership with us. All right, let's dive into Mark chapter nine. That was a super long intro. Let's get to the text. Mark chapter nine, verse one. It says, and he said to them, this is Jesus here. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So we get into chapter nine and really chapter nine, verse one is a conclusion to Jesus's talk that he was giving to his disciples. He's kind of giving them like a, like a bit of a pep talk, kind of an odd pep talk. because basically he's saying like, hey, if you wanna follow me, you gotta die. All right, that was the end of chapter eight. Like hoorah, let's go get it. You know, so that's Jesus. He's telling his disciples that in the end of chapter eight. And here in chapter nine, he says, but there are some of you that are gonna see some really powerful signs of the kingdom happen before you die. So, so what exactly is Jesus getting at there? What's he alluding to? I, I don't wanna make it more complicated than it is. I, I think really what Jesus is likely referring to here is not a reference to any one particular event, but Jesus is setting the stage for his disciples from a, a series of different events that are gonna happen, ultimately culminating in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Jesus is kind of giving his disciples a, a roadmap of, of what it's going to look like. And, and a few of these events, these powerful kingdom display type events are actually gonna happen right here in Mark chapter nine. Namely, Jesus' transfiguration on the mountaintop and then also the healing of a demon-possessed boy at the end of chapter nine. And so those are gonna be the two things that kind of guide our time here together today. Those are kind of the two scenes that we're gonna unpack. The mountaintop, where Jesus is transfigured in this glorious moment, and then the mess, when Jesus and his disciples come off the mountaintop and they're greeted with utter chaos, and disciples are arguing, and there's a boy who's demon-possessed, and there's this large crowd. And so we're gonna kind of use those two scenes kind of as our roadmap together. Now, here's the thing about those two scenes. One of the things I think is helpful for us all to see is that what unites us all in this room is that we are probably in one or more of the, we're probably in one or the other of those two scenes. Like we probably find ourselves either on the mountaintop or in the mess. There's not really a middle ground. Like either we're in a place in our life, we're in a season where things are, are going well. Maybe we're in a season where, you know, there's fruit in our life and we're, we can sense the presence of God and our quiet time is really sweet. And things are just kind of moving along well. Or maybe we're in a season where we're swamped with stress, someone else in the family is sick, Work is difficult. The kids are disobedient again. This is the everyday mess. We're either in the mountaintop or we're in the mess. There's not really much of a middle, but here's the thing. This is the big idea that I want us all to take away. Whether you're on the mountaintop or whether you're in the mess, we need Jesus. 
And that's what Mark 9 is going to show us. Whether we're on the mountaintop or whether we're in the mess, we need Jesus. So let's pick back up in verse 2. Verse 2, it says, and after six days. Now, that's interesting. There's some things that are going on here when we put our Jewish lenses on that we begin to see is alluding back to another story. We'll talk about that in a second. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were walking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, <laughs> he said, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, uh, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a, a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. So here's our first scene. We're on the mountaintop. There's a few things I want to do in kind of unpacking what is, what's going on here on the mountaintop. The first is you look back at verse 2. That's not random. Okay, if we put our Jewish lenses on for just a second, we see that there's an event happening here in Mark 9 that is pointing us back to an event that happened in Exodus chapter 24. Because in Exodus chapter 24, the leader of the Israelites, Moses, took a few of his guys and he went up on a mountain and there was a cloud and God spoke out of that cloud. It says in Exodus 24, verse 16, it says, for six days, the cloud covered the mountain. And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. So in Exodus 24, Moses goes up the mountain with his buddies. In Mark chapter nine, Jesus now is going up the mountain. He's taking a group of men with him. You have a cloud, you have the presence of God you have God speaking out of that cloud, but there's one big difference between Exodus 24 and Mark 9. See, the difference is that in Exodus chapter 24, Moses experienced the presence of God. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus is the presence of God. There's a big difference as to what's going on here, and it says there in verse 3 that Jesus was transfigured. Really, basically what that's saying is that he changed. Like there's some pretty magnificent change that goes about when the disciples see Jesus now, it's interesting that Mark, for whatever reason, he chooses to use the visual of bleach. Uh, I'm not really sure. Like if he was like watching the Clorox commercial, you know, he's like, and he was like bleach. His clothes were like white. You know, it's like he's watching and he's like, Jesus is on the mountain. He's got his dirty clothes on. He throws them in the washing machine. They come out like white is white. Like I'm not really sure why, but nonetheless, that's the visual that Mark uses to try to help us to see like something magnificent has changed in Jesus's appearance. But here's the thing. This is the big thing that we need to see as it relates to the transfiguration. The big thing is that Jesus' glory on the mountain, his, his transfiguredness, that was actually Jesus returning to the glory that was rightfully his and that he had had before the creation of the world. Like, this is not a new Jesus. Like, this is the true Jesus. I love what one commentator said, the true great transfiguration had already taken place at Bethlehem when God took human form. And on the mountain of transfiguration, Jesus was but reassuming his own true form, even if only temporarily. Faith had momentarily passed into sight for the three disciples. So what the disciples get to witness is, again, it, it's not a new Jesus. This is the true, real Jesus in his glorified state. So they have this visual, but it's not the only visual they have because then all of a sudden Moses and Elijah are there. And so there's another visual that the disciples have. Moses in the New Testament he would, have represented the, he would have represented the law, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And then you have Elijah, and he represents the prophets. And so what the disciples are essentially seeing here is that all of the law and all of the prophets, what do they ultimately point to? What are they ultimately about? They're about Jesus. Jesus himself, when he was resurrected, he would actually begin to teach his disciples. In Luke chapter 24, verse 27, it says that Jesus taught his disciples how all of the law and all of the prophets we're about him. And so you have this beautiful scene, this glorious scene, this magnificent scene. And then, and then Peter, Peter opens his mouth. <laughs> like Peter like totally ruins the moment, you know? And it says he ruins the moment because look, in verse six, what does it say? He, he was terrified. Now, let's be honest. All of us have had a moment in our life where we've been scared or nervous or embarrassed and we just kind of like 
said something, all right? For whatever reason, the story that came to my mind this week was when I was in sixth grade, we uh, had a field trip. It was an overnight field trip. Uh, and my dad was gonna be a chaperone. Now, when you're in sixth grade and you're trying to get some cool cred, your dad chaperoning an overnight field trip doesn't really be, it's not a good idea, you know? So my buddies are like giving me such a hard time about this, you know? And for like weeks, they're like making fun of me. And I remember one day, we're standing outside the cafeteria, Elkins Park Middle School, and, uh, and they're just like ribbing me hard, you know? And you know, sixth graders, they can say some mean things. And they're talking to me and, and, and I'm so embarrassed. And so I just like blurt out like the first thing that, that comes to my mind. I was like, oh yeah? I was like, well, my dad went to jail. <laughs> and, and, now, let me give you some context. Uh, first, my dad never went to jail. Uh, I'm, I, the second thing I thought was like, and looking back, I'm like, why did I think that was the thing that was gonna like make me like cool as a six? I don't know, like, why, why didn't I say like, my dad was an NFL quarterback or like my dad was a brain surgeon. Like, I'm not really sure like why I didn't go there. But nonetheless, like I said, you know, my dad went to jail. And then the kicker is I went home and tried to convince my dad to go along with it. <laughs> I was like, dad, you gotta go along with it, you know? And I've blocked the rest of that story out of my memory. So I'm not really sure what happened. <laughs> But we've all been there. We've all been in those moments where we just kind of blurt something out. And here Peter blurt something out in the middle of this magnificent moment. But I think it's in Peter's stupidity. It's the moment of him just blurting this out that we begin to actually see our need for Jesus on the mountaintop. Remember, why does it say that he spoke? He spoke because he was terrified. And it's interesting because if you look at this account in Matthew chapter 17, what it says is that they were terrified after the Lord spoke out of the cloud. So I'm like, okay, what do you do with that? Well, I think you just put them together and realize they were terrified the entire time. <laughs> like, like the whole experience was terrifying to them. Why? Why is that the case? Well, it's the case because in the Bible, when you saw the full glory of God, you died. <laughs> and so here the disciples are standing amidst, right in front of the full glory of God in Jesus, and they're not dead. They think, man, we're supposed to be dead but they're not dead. So why is that? Why is it that they didn't die? It's because Jesus is there. The only reason that the disciples didn't drop over dead in the presence of God is because Jesus is there. And Mark makes a point there in verse eight to say that only Jesus was then there. Like, like Moses is gone, Elijah is gone, and it is only Jesus that is left, and the disciples are not dead. They were ushered into the presence of God and did not die. So what are we supposed to do with that? How, what exactly do we learn from this? Well, I, I think one of the main things is that we learn is that Jesus, he's not just another prophet. Jesus is not just another Jewish leader. Jesus is the very son of God. He is God himself. He is the Messiah. He is the savior. And it's because of Jesus that we can have access to God. Like that in Jesus, we can come into the very presence of God. In all of our sinfulness, in all of our shame, in all the things that we bring to the table, we can come into the very presence of a holy God. That's the gospel. Uh, the gospel says that apart from Christ, that we are sinful, that we cannot stand before God. There is a reason why the disciples were afraid. They should have been afraid. They're afraid because they know that they are in front of a holy God and they are sinners. It's why when we sin, when we do something wrong, we feel the need to hide it. We feel ashamed of it. We feel that way because before a holy God, we realize our sin. But then Jesus comes and he takes the penalty for our sin. He, he steps in and he takes the wrath of God in our place. I love what Tim Keller said. He said, on the mountain, Jesus is surrounded by God. But on the cross, he's abandoned by God. And so Jesus abandons the presence of God so that you and I, if we are in him, can be ushered into the presence of God. No fear. We don't have to be afraid. Even though we as sinners, we can come before a holy God because of Jesus. So the disciples begin to make their way off of the mountain with Jesus. We're gonna move down to verse 14. Look at verse 14. As they're moving down off the mountain, the disciples are asking Jesus some questions. And he's doing some teaching, but then we get to verse 14, and it says this. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them. The scribes were arguing with them. 
And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and they ran up to him and they greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and he becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and he rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, listen to the desperation of the father. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So we move from one scene to the next, from the mountaintop to the mess. Jesus comes off the mountaintop with his three disciples and they head down and they're greeted by the other disciples and these disciples are arguing with the scribes. There's this large crowd, it's just chaos. And out of that chaos comes this dad and he's desperate for the healing of his son. And I think what we see in the story and I think what the Bible is trying to teach us here is that there's a reason why these stories go right back to back because oftentimes we come right off the mountain into the mess. But here's the thing, and I think this is hard for us sometimes to kind of come to grips with. More often than not, on this side of eternity, our life will be spent in the mess. More often than not, in this side of eternity, when there's brokenness and sin and evil, more often our life will be categorized by this second scene, the mess. And that's hard. We don't necessarily want that. Peter certainly didn't want that. You think back to what Peter said when he was on the mountain, he kind of blurts something out about tents and this is good that we are here. What really, I think what Peter was saying in his response there on the mountain was, Jesus, we don't want this moment to end. Like we wanna bottle this thing up and like, let's just stay here and be here for as long as we possibly can. I don't know if you maybe had an experience in your life, maybe it was a worship service. Maybe, maybe it was a service like you're gonna have in a few weeks where you're baptizing people and and you're just seeing God moving in people's life and you're like, man, this is good. <laughs> like, let's just stay here. Maybe it's a worship and prayer night. Maybe there was an event on your college campus. Maybe there was a camp that you went to when you were in junior high or high school. And you had this moment where it was just, it was a mountaintop moment and you just felt the presence of God and, and you just, man, it, God was using that in a powerful way in, in your life. And you said, I just don't wanna leave here. I wanna bottle this thing up. Like I wanna stay. And we live in this kind of Instagram age where it's like, we wanna just take a snapshot and just live in that moment perpetually. And what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to see here is that the mountaintop moment for these three disciples, it was never meant for them to consume. It was meant for them to be filled for further ministry. This is what Jesus has been trying to get his disciples to see all along. This is what you guys have been looking at. Jesus is saying, yes, you, this is me in my full glory. But the only way to get to this, what they saw on the mountain, his transfigured nature, the only way to get to this, the pathway to that is through suffering and death. What you guys have been looking at is that the disciples, they didn't wanna hear that. They didn't want that. <laughs> they didn't want the cross. They wanted to transfigure Jesus without the cross. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not how it works. The only way to my glory is through the cross. So I think there's probably maybe some of us in here, maybe we're so busy chasing after the mountaintop moment that we had a month ago, 10 months ago, 10 years ago. We're busy chasing after that, not realizing what Jesus is trying to teach us in the middle of our mess. I think about that in our own life, just thinking back over the last 10 years at Mercy Hill, and I'm not saying that every moment was a mountaintop. There was a lot of mess. But there were moments that God gave us that they were true mountaintop moments. Now, I remember one Easter, we were baptizing, and I had the privilege as one of the pastors to be in the baptismal baptizing people, and we baptized over 100 people that morning. 
And we were, and I think at that point, we weren't even a thousand people as a church. And I mean, people were just like coming one after the other, after the other. College students, high school students, retirees. I mean, it, it didn't matter. They were coming, crying. God was changing people. He was, he was saving people. It was just a powerful moment. And I'm there just like baptizing one person after the other. And I think back to these moments on the mountaintop that God has given us over the last several years. And then I think back to the last four months. It's been a bit more of a season of the mess. I think about my wife who's traveled back now twice to the States for funerals for her grandparents. I think back to the day I walked outside. It was three weeks after we had moved in. I get in my van and I realized someone had broken into my van and stolen my wallet and all my stuff. I'm like, come on, Canada. Like, I moved here because I thought you didn't commit crime. Like, this is like, what? Think about how many nights we've sat on the, the side of our kids' bed, many of our kids' beds, and they're crying, and they're just saying, Dad, I want to go home. I want to go home. And I think about that, and I'm like, God, what are you doing? Like, I just want the mountaintop. Like, I just want to go back to the mountaintop. And what God has been reminding me is he said, I gave you the mountaintop moment to fuel your worship in the midst of this mess. In the midst of the brokenness, in the midst of the evil, in the midst of the sin all around us, God says, I let you have that mountaintop moment for a purpose. And that fuels our worship in the midst of the mess. And so here's Jesus. He's off the mountain, right into the mess, encounters this desperate dad whose son is demon-possessed. And I think it's helpful when we encounter these stories these events in the Bible, sometimes I think we can kind of come to them a little bit emotionally distant, as if this isn't like a real event with a real dad who has a name and this son who has a name and like real emotions. And so just for a second, as we kind of look back at this story, let's just remember that this is a real dad and, and he's got real heartache and real pain and you don't have to be a parent to identify with the type of desperation that this dad must feel. For him to have a son who he's watched go through this horrific event throughout childhood. This dad who's got so much pain and so much heartache. He's desperate. He's desperate because his son is demon possessed. And the demon has one intent. And it says there that it was to destroy him. And I think this is a really good opportunity for us to just pause for a second and just as an aside to just say that Remind ourselves that there is a real enemy whose one intent in your life is to seek, kill, and destroy you. And so you might be in here and you might think, you know, and I, you know I'm in a destructive relationship. I know, it's, it's not a good relationship. I, I know I need to fix, it was a bad choice. What you think is a bad choice, the enemy looks at and says, no, that's a means for me to destroy you. You think, man, I, I, there's a secret addiction or a secret sin that I have. I know I, I'm, I'm gonna get a handle on it. I'll figure it out. I'll fix it. What to you seems like a harmless secret sin, the enemy looks at and he sees as an opportunity to destroy you. That paycheck that you idolize and that greed that is beginning to fester in your life and that idol that is growing in you is not just simply an idol. It is something that the enemy would, rather, would like to use to destroy you. There's anger issues that well up in you that you think maybe are just kind of a character flaw that you just need to work on, but they're not that big of a deal. Those issues are things that the enemy looks at and says, I'm gonna use that to destroy you. That's what the enemy does. And so on the mountaintop, we realize that our need for Jesus is so that we can have access to God. In the mess, we realize that we need Jesus to heal us because we live in a world full of evil and wickedness and brokenness. The good news is that Jesus heals all of it. He heals all of it. So let me ask you today, do you find yourself in the mess? Like, is that where you find yourself? And maybe you're in here and you'd be honest and you would say, you know what, yeah, I do find myself in the mess. But you go one step further and you would say, you know what, I also don't really think I'm a follower of Jesus. Like, like I'm in the mess, but I also wouldn't necessarily characterize myself as a follower of Jesus. I've never really actually put my faith in him. Maybe, maybe that's you and you said, yeah, you know what, I, I've also been chasing after the mountaintop, well, what you realize is that as you chase after the mountaintop and you get there, you realize that a mountaintop without Jesus is not a mountaintop at all. Or maybe you're here and you say, no, I, I, am, I am a Christian. I am a follower of Jesus. But the mess is also what would characterize your life right now. And maybe it's not something big. Maybe it's just the mundane stress of everyday life. 
And you're a follower of Jesus, but you very much identify with the second scene, the mess. Well, here's the thing, whether you're a Christian or not, here's the good news. Look in verse 23. Verse 23, it says, and Jesus said to him, (laughs) he said, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and he said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the crowd, when they had come running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. So the good news here is what the father teaches us. And that is that in order to come to Jesus, in order to have access to Jesus, like we don't have to have it all together. (laughs) I love what Keller says. He says, helplessness, not holiness, is your first step to accessing God. And so if you're in here and you're not a Christian, the good news for you is that what God asks you to bring to him is not your effort. It's not all your hard work, it's your desperation. That's what God asks you to bring to him. But listen, if you are a Christian, listen, don't miss this. Desperation for the Christian is not just circumstantial, it is a posture of the heart. Desperation is not just contingent on your circumstances, whether things are going good or things are going bad. Desperation for the Christian is not a place, it's a posture. It's recognizing that every single day, whether you're on the mountaintop or whether you're in the mess, you need Jesus. We need Jesus. I think this plea from the Father is probably one of the most raw statements in all of the Bible. He says, help my unbelief. And what this is, is this is not a put a smile on and pretend like everything is okay type Christianity. That's not what this is. This is an acknowledgement that living on this side of eternity, there is brokenness. And there are some times in your life where you say, God, I believe, help, help my unbelief. There's a couple on our team that I got to meet over a year ago. Uh, they're from a uh, small province right next to Nova Scotia where my, my, my mother's from, Prince Edward Island. And I've known about them, family connections, and knew that they had kind of had a lot going on in the last several years of their life. And so he's actually in ministry. And we approached them last year and we said, hey, would you guys think about moving over to Halifax and being a part of what we're doing and help plant this church with us? And so I had the chance last November just to kind of listen and have them unpack their story. They've been through a lot of church hurt and there's a lot of stuff that the Lord has kind of brought them in, a lot of mess. They were telling me about the day when they went to the hospital to deliver their third child. They were recounting this story that they get to the hospital and everything's going well and they get Krista all set up and she's there and she's ready to deliver their third child. It's kind of old hat for them. And not too long after the delivery starts, they realize that everything's not okay. Krista gives birth to a stillborn baby girl. And they're telling me this story years after it's happened, still through tears. <laughs> and I think about Josh and Kristen, I think about next month as we sit with them and we pray and we remember in November the death of their daughter. And I think about that mess. And sometimes I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. But what I realize is that as Christians, the gospel, it doesn't tell us to pretend like everything is okay. See, what the gospel does is it reminds us that in the midst of our mess, we need Jesus. And that one day, all of us will see Jesus transfigured. We will all see the full glory of Jesus and everything will be okay. So the question then is, what do we do with this? As we move to a conclusion, what what do we do with this? Do you notice what Jesus says as to why his disciples couldn't cast out the demons? (laughs) Look look back at verse 28. This is so interesting. Verse 28, it says, and when he had entered the house, his disciples, I imagine them kind of like head hung, like in shame. His disciples came to him privately and they said, why could we not, why could we not cast it out? (laughs) And he said to them, this kind cannot come out, cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Prayer. (laughs) Jesus says, 
you couldn't cast out the demon because you didn't pray. You think about that, well, like, what, what is prayer? Like at its most basic component, prayer is an acknowledgement before God. It's a conversation with God where you're acknowledging, God, I am who I am and you are who you are and I cannot do anything without you. And so somewhere along the way, what happened was these disciples, they got it in their head that they didn't need Jesus to cast out demons. That even in the mess, they were okay to do it on their own. And Jesus says, no, (laughs) you forgot one very critical, critical part. You need me. So I think there's probably some of us in here this morning that we just need to realize our need for Jesus. Maybe there's some of us that are in the midst of the mess. And again, maybe it's not something catastrophic. Maybe it's something that's very basic. But we've been just trying to do it on our own. And what Jesus is trying to say to us here is the qualification to be a follower of Jesus, the basic qualification is not theological astuteness. It's not living everything in a perfect way. Living rightly, theological astuteness, those are good things. The basic qualification to follow Jesus is need. It's need. Jesus is showing his disciples here, you forgot that you need me. So here's what I wanna do. Go ahead and close your Bibles. What I wanna do just kind of in a moment with you just before the Lord, I I want us to offer up a Lord help my unbelief prayer. What, what, What is your help my unbelief prayer today? So right where you're at in your seat, let's go ahead, let's just close our eyes. Let's come before the Lord. And let's just, no pretense. Let's just come before him and acknowledge that there are times in our life where we say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So what is your help my unbelief prayer today? Maybe for some of you in here, your help my unbelief prayer is an acknowledgement that maybe you grew up in church, maybe you've been around church, maybe you have Christian friends, maybe you've been here for a few weeks and you realize that you need to believe for the first time. Maybe your prayer is, Lord, I believe, help me to believe for the very first time that you, you have taken the penalty for my sin. Before you, God, I am a sinner and I should be afraid in your presence, but Jesus, he took that. God, help my unbelief. Help me to believe for the first time. But I know there's many more of us in here that probably you have a help my unbelief prayer that's something like this. You say, Lord, I believe, but my son or my daughter has walked away from the faith and I've been praying for 10 years. Lord, help my unbelief. Come to the Lord desperately and we say, Lord, I believe, but God, I've been struggling with this sin in my life and God, you know that I wanna get rid of it. You know that I'm tired of fighting this day after day. Lord, I, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, but God, I have no joy in my life. It's hard for me to get out of bed. God, I believe, help my unbelief. What is our help my unbelief prayer? Our acknowledgement before the Lord that we we need Him for everything. Heavenly Father, we thank You that Father, in the midst of our need, You meet us right there. Father, we need you. So Father, as we bring these prayers to you, Father, we do so through the lens of what we just read in your word that shows us that God, when we bring our need to you, Father, you meet us there. And Father, with love and compassion as Jesus did to this Father, Father, you meet our needs. So Father, I don't know what all of the prayers are being offered, but I know who you are. And as a loving father, God, I know how you answer these prayers. Father, as a loving father, I know how you meet every single one of these persons in this room today that is bringing these prayers before you. We rejoice, Father, knowing in who you are. And we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen.